Jon. Okay, I think we're ready for the next session. Uh, Roberto and Dipesh, are you both with us? Uh, yep. Yes. <clears throat> but my video, I think, has, it has to be turned on from your end. Let's see here. Mine too. Yes, let's see here. Okay, let's see if we can see you now. Yeah, yeah. Visible I, now. You should Depeche. see me now. Yeah, can you see us yeah. also, Depeche? I, I can see you, but, uh, but my video is still off. Yeah, I think you can turn on your video now. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. Great. Come on. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> So hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, it depends where you are. Yeah, good morning from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining us for this uh, very first session of Streaming Streams. As Ferker said, we consider this three-day event uh, as a sort of warming up trailer for the real conference that will be held in one year's time in Stockholm. So my name is Roberta Biasilla and I'm an environmental historian working at the Environmental Humanities Laboratory and I will coordinate this session with uh, Johan Gardepo. Johan uh, was a PhD in History of Science, Technology and the Environment from the division and is a historian of technology. So before uh, handing the word over to him for a few technical guidelines, I would like to thank all our colleagues that are right in the back uh, yeah, there, uh, and are dealing now with all the logistics uh, of these online meetings and the members of the organizing committee. Uh, so if you want to know more about us and about the conference, you can visit the division webpage. And I also encourage you to visit the conference website, meetstreams.com. So Jon, do you want to give us a few details on how to post questions? In it? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> uh, the way would, this will progress is that you who are listening in um, will be able to ask questions to Depeche. And um, uh, you do that by clicking on the Q&A and you post your questions there. Once you go into the Q&A section, which is um, at the bottom corner of your Zoom window, uh, you should also be able to see other questions. So if there is other questions, you can also uh, vote on them if you think they are um, similar to the kind of questions you want to see raised. And we'll bring them up later on as the conversation goes along. Uh, but, but without f further ado, we can, I think we can kick this off. When the, how, the session is for an hour, Johan? A, a bit okay. less than an hour. <coughs> okay. Less. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, yeah, I, I want to introduce our guest, 
uh, even if the best chakra but it doesn't really need an introduction and it's a great honor for all of us having him and thanks for accepting thank our invitation and for kicking up this conference is really a honor so um, besides other affiliations, Deepesh is the Lawrence Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and a college at the University of Chicago. His most recent books are The Crisis of Civilization, Exploring Global and Planetary History, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. And the other book is The Calling of History, Sir Yadunath Sarkar and his Empire of Proof, uh, published by University of Chicago Press in 2015. He is the author of the most cited paper, The Climate of History for Thesis, which appeared in Critical Inquiry in 2009. And we will go back to this uh, together with this ongoing project during our interview. Uh, Dipesh is also a prominent figure in post colonial studies and critical theory. His book, Provincializing Europe, uh, published in 2000, has been translated into Italian, Korean, Chinese, Polish, Spanish, Turkish, French, and is the founding member of the editorial collective of Subaltern Studies, a consulting editor of Critical Inquiry, and the founding editor of Postcolonial Studies. So I will stop here because I can at <laughs> least forever his uh, academic achievement. Thank you. But as you may have noted, we will place this conversation at the confluence of two specialities of Deepesh scholarship. On, um, on the one side, um, the global and environmental history, and on the other side, the colonization. And the title of this conversation is uh, Tangled in Knots. And we will try to stick to it and explore uh, major methodological and theoretical tension within the environmental humanities field. And uh, one aspect I would really like to explore more and let emerge from this conversation is the decolonial dimension of the field of the environmental humanities, both in theoretical and empirical terms. Uh, if you're happy with this introduction, uh, Dibesh, I can start with the first question. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so the first note uh, I would like to raise here is the scale of analysis or the scales of analysis that, that are crucial in the environmental humanities. So you have demonstrated that the contemporary ecological crisis from which the environmental humanities emerged is a global phenomenon and also that climate change is a planetary conjunction. I'm using terms from your, uh, your scholarship. So on the one hand, you have established this strong connection between globalization and climate change related events. But on the other side, when we as scholars adopt a post-colonial and decolonial or feminist perspective, uh, we find ourselves stressing place-based reconstructions, individual and group perceptions, and also individual feelings and stories. So can you explain how we can reconcile, if we can, this universal trajectory of history on one side and historical differences uh, that characterize stories from the fields. And of course, apart from those two extremes, uh, we can always scale up and scale down to achieve like inclusive and just understandings and reconstructions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so, Obviously, whether you're a humanities person or whether you're a science person, um, humans are always dealing with matters on different scale. And uh, even in my university, the president deals with the university on a scale that is larger than the scale on which I deal with the university, right? So humans use numbers. <laughs> they use, they, we have ways of translating between scales. So when the president of, the country, of, of a country is dealing, or the prime minister is dealing with the budget of a country, that's different from me, my dealing with the budget of my family. And um, so moving between scales is what humans do. So, so as such, to know that uh, a phenomenon can occur on different scales, similar phenomenon, or that something occurs on a large scale but can impact me on a small scale uh, is part of what humans know about the world. And sometimes it poses a problem and sometimes it's not. And sometimes we are not even <clears throat> aware 
of how the large scale figures in my individual life as a small scale thing. So to give you an example, um, <clears throat> so you know, one of the claims made by uh, earth system scientists like Jan Zalasovic and people who are leading the charge on the science side on climate change is that humans have become one of the most important geomorphological forces on the planet. In other words, <clears throat> we reshape the surface of the planet. And um, not just on land, but even in the continental shelves. And one of the ubiquitous iconic symbol of that, human capacity to move Earth from one place to another, are these yellow, the usually yellow colored caterpillar machines that you see everywhere, wherever you go in the world, is this construction going on? You will see one of these big machines digging Earth out. You know, when I was when I was growing up in India, of course, we didn't have these machines. And I would always see small people, often women, carrying loads of soil or something on their baskets, up scaffoldings when a building was being built. But these days, even in India, I see these huge caterpillar machines. But these huge caterpillar machines are also available as small miniature toys for children. So sometimes in Chicago, I suddenly see a child actually playing with toys which are miniaturized caterpillar machines so that you can see that for the child, the geomorphological role of humans is just natural. So it is already, so as the child is sort of waking up to the world, this particular child have in mind, and you can see that for him, the world has always had caterpillar machines and children have always played with caterpillar machines. You know, it's, it's Ursula Heise who uh, showed in her book on um, environmental hazards that when all these big uh, drums turned up in cities with the label saying hazmat, hazardous material in, on them, they also turned up as little toys for children. So there are, there are many interesting ways in which the big and the small come together, even in our individual lives. But sometimes the big and the small are in conflict. And one interesting example of that is really the story of air conditioners in a place like Delhi. So, you know, all Indian cities are becoming heat islands for all kinds of reasons, but, but basically they're becoming hotter and hotter. So people are more and people, more and more people are buying air conditioners. And even in slums, relatively poor people get together to buy their first air conditioners and the air conditioner sales are booming. Not because people are buying their second and third unit, but because people are buying their first unit in the cities. The interesting thing is that the air conditioners are going to make the cities even more hot. These are old technology air conditioners. India fought hard at the conference in uh, Kigali in Rwanda that took place in 2016 to be one of the slowest countries to change to new technology of air conditioners. These, the old ones are very bad for the, uh, for the climate, for global warming. But if you ask people, why do you buy air conditioners? They will say they, they, live, they live better, they sleep better. Their children can prepare for entrance exams to medical schools and law schools and all kinds of things. So you can see that the families are quite understandably focused on the short term, right? On being able to sleep better, on being able to live better, on being able to satisfy the aspirations of the children at the expense of the longer term future of the city. So here is a case where the short term and the long term are in conflict. Whereas with my example of the Anthropocene toys, the child's enjoyment has aligned itself with the world's crisis. <laughs> I mean, the child doesn't know it, but you, can, but you can see that there are many moments when humans actually enjoy their huge capacity to change the planet. When that capacity turns up in my small individual life, as a moment of enjoyment. Whereas the moment of enjoyment with the air conditioner in Delhi is a moment of enjoyment for the people who are consuming that product, but it's actually destroying the future of the city longer term. So, you know, these scales are sometimes in conflict. These scales sometimes align themselves. So it really depends on the problem you're addressing. With some problems, 
you can address the long term in your short term life. Whereas with, with some other problems, you have to leave it to generations. You know, for the next generation. I mean, sometimes with climate change, when we say, you know, it's going to get worse in, let's say, 100 years time, effectively, we're leaving it to the next generation uh, to, to deal with some of the problems. So, so what I'm saying is that there are multiple scales. Humans have always dealt with it. Here, in this case, sometimes the scale is huge. So if, if somebody tells you that global warming sets back uh, the next ice age by anything between 5,000 to 50,000 years, now that's on a scale where you really can't do very much, even if you know it intellectually, that that may happen. It, it's just so far into the future, you can't do very much. Right? For in human perspective. So, okay, I, I will try to uh, build on this like alliance or uh, conflicts that can raise why we are analyzing uh, process and also this translation process you addressed to. And uh, you also mentioned the concept of the Anthropocene uh, that I think is quite crucial here. And the, the other notes um, that I would like to explore with you and also uh, bring back this um, points that you just raised is this relation between sciences and humanities and these relations has changed over the last decades and uh, so my question is uh, first of all if according to you the environmental humanities are questioning this relationship and uh, rebalancing it in a different way or uh, mm, when we try to translate and bring a term like the Anthropocene from one realm of knowledge, like the natural sciences, into another realm of knowledge, the humanities, what we can gain and also what we can lose in this, in this process. And um, so how, how are the environmental humanities uh, challenging or aligning with the scientific consensus on climate change? So as you know, um... So the Anthropocene is a very debated term, um, especially in the human sciences, both in humanities and in the social sciences. It's also a debated term among geologists. Otherwise, if they didn't debate it, it would be a formal term, right? The one reason why it has not been formalized is because not all geologists are in agreement that, uh, that we need to rename this part of the Holocene as Anthropocene. So it's, it's what I'm saying is it's a debated term even among geologists, as far as I understand it. Not everybody is on board with the idea, but many are. And it's also, but it's debated among uh, social scientists and humanists uh, for different sets of reasons. Uh, so as you know, the, some people are suspicious of the term because they think that to call a, a period by this name Anthropocene is like, is like blaming the whole of humanity for a problem that really has been created by a section of humanity. So if you look at uh, either the nations that produce most of the greenhouse gases or the classes, you will find that it's the more affluent nations. It's really 12 or 14 nations that produce the bulk of the greenhouse gases out of you know, more than 150 nations in the world. It's one fifth of humanity that are more responsible for the production of these gases. So, so some people think therefore to call it by the name Anthropocene is to adopt a gesture that looks like you're blaming all of humanity, Anthropos, uh, for what's, what's happening. So they would each actually therefore even uh, have trouble with the expression human induced global warming or anthropogenic global warming for the same reason. So that's why some of them like to call it capitalocene to emphasize the role of capitalism. Some of them call it econocene to emphasize the role of the neoliberal global economy. Uh, some of them call it the plantationocene to take it back to the colonial world of slavery and inequalities and the whole question of race. Uh, Catherine Yusuf 
uh, has a book called A Billion Anthropocenes or, you know, or, or not none, like which is the argument about race. Um, so on the humanities side, there's a, there's a deep suspicion that uh, somehow naming it after the Anthropos is a gesture of denying inequalities that have played a role in the coming of, in the, in the making of global warming. So that's one reason why uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of debate in the humanities and uh, in the social sciences about it. But there are also people like, uh, even among Marxists, see there's there are also difference of opinion even in the, among social scientists and humanists. Somebody like Ian Angus, who's a Marxist and wrote a book called Facing the Anthropocene or something like that, right? I mean, he actually, he doesn't object to the word Anthropocene and he thinks it makes scientific sense to use that term, but social scientists need to work on the role of capitalism in producing it. And one could, one could therefore say that, look, it's possible, they could, one could visualize a division of labor. You could say, look, the scientists are good at being able to detect that the average temperature of the Earth's surface is increasing. They're, they're also able to tell you that this has to do with fossil fuels, or with greenhouse gases, and therefore has to do with institutions. And then it is really up to social scientists and humanists to decide which institutions, why those institutions, right? And all I can say is that while there are strong opinions, even on the role of capitalism, but even within that camp, as there should be, there are differences of opinion. So somebody like Andreas Mam and Jason Moore, who were both otherwise in uh, favor of the word capitalism, disagree on how they view the role of capitalism. So and, you're, sorry, um, Robert, I was just going to end by saying, and as a humanist, you realize that humanists thrive on disagreement. That's, that's how we think. I mean, <laughs> all our arguments are aimed at destabilizing <laughs> Uh, consensus, right? So, so we also belong to fields that actually thrive on, on disagreement, and partly because we are not often called upon to prescribe policy. So, uh, your idea is that uh, I don't know if I'm right here that the term anthropocene is not losing momentum; it's just changing its shape and right. transforming. So basically, it. yeah. Just so you to could stress. Say you could say there are many Anthropocenes. Uh, people understand different things by the word Anthropocene. And, and actually Peter Half, who's a geologist and who invented the idea of the technosphere, argues in the paper that, that one should make a distinction between the scientist Anthropocene and the social scientist Anthropocene. <laughs> that these might be two different things. So he, so he kind of said, okay, you, Okay, you know, social science people, you have your Anthropocene to fight about. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I'm not saying that's, a, that's not always a satisfactory response. But, but Jalasevich actually says, and I'm paraphrasing him, that there are many Anthropocenes out there. Yeah, I think we should reclaim a bit more the use of plurals, like sciences is not science, and Anthropocenes are not the Anthropocene. Uh, and I was uh, also, Curious about this translation between uh, science, uh, sciences and humanities. Can you give us other examples of terms like the Anthropocene or the technosphere that you uh, just... Uh... Um, yes, I mean, particularly, <clears throat> see, I mean, as you can see, see what we call the sciences, uh, physics or chemistry or biology or geology, <clears throat> the world out there is, it's neither physics, nor chemistry, nor biology, nor zoology. The world is the mixture of all these things. I mean, we in our academic disciplines carve it up. So every academic discipline represents ways of seeing, ways of imagining the world. And even the earth system scientists imagine an earth system. We don't run into it, right? And in fact, what you, what's amazing about Earth system scientists is once they have imagined this object called Earth system, 
they respond to it as humans would. They respond with fear, with concern, with anxiety, with hope, with despair. So what's fascinating even to study scientists is that the, <clears throat> the scientists may use a particular language of experimentation and rationality and all that, but it's not like the work is without affect. The work actually has affect. And, and wherever, wherever there is affect, affect can only be theorized by the humanities people. The scientists can't theorize their own affects. So, so even though the disciplines carve things up, there are always leakages between disciplines. And a discipline like, so there are, there are disciplines that are very reductive, like, or used to be reductive, like physics or chemistry. There are disciplines like geology and biology, which are not reductive because they actually already involve chemistry and physics. So they're inherently multi, multidisciplinary, inherent in their own formations, right? So they're not fundamental disciplines, quote unquote fundamental, like in that sense. And then, <clears throat> so, so I don't think there is inherently anything there to stop scientists and humanists from learning from each other. Because as I said, no discipline is as pure as it wants to be. The practitioners of disciplines actually have emotions over what they talk about. Even physicists who talk about string theory, which is still kind of uh, a source of huge disagreement between physicists. And I know physicists who have stopped talking to each other <laughs> because of disagreements <laughs> on string theory. Now, so what I'm saying is that human beings have emotions about what they study. And one can actually go to scientists even to study the emotions they have about what they study. And I have tremendously benefited actually from studying the way in which earth system scientists respond emotionally, as I said, with care, with concern, with anxiety, with despair, with hope. When they study an object, they have themselves created an abstract object called the Earth system. Um, on the human, so sometimes I find that the, that the distinction that you were making a little earlier on is made more on the science of science studies people. So the science studies people fight the ghost of something they call science with capital S. Scientists don't, themselves don't operate with the idea that there's one science with capital S. Um, because science has become so specialized. I, I, know, I knew an Indian couple who actually uh, worked in Sweden where the husband was a virologist and the wife was a bacteriologist and they couldn't speak to each other. Their specialization was so, <laughs> so different. So, so I'm, I'm putting it to you that if you're a practicing scientist, you seldom think of science as this one big capital science. That is science as ideology. But I think in science studies, when we pluralize science, we say sciences, we pluralize in the interest of fighting something that we think has an ideological function, right? So, and there we are right, and because science with the capital S has an ideological function, and that is often used by the science establishment or governments to legitimize something, and therefore to fight the single, the, the assumed singularness of science is absolutely right. If somebody is trying to use their power and, and, and pursue their worldly ends by presenting science as if it's one thing. So when India was modernizing after independence, our prime minister Nehru, for whom I have a lot of regard and a lot of respect, but he used to go, go along, go around telling people, you must develop a scientific temperament all Indians. So the fact is that most of our practicing scientists don't have scientific temperament. They go to temples, they worship gods, they believe in ghosts in their personal life. <laughs> the, you know, the practice of science doesn't require you to always have a scientific temperament. You can go to the lab and do your own little thing that you do. So science as ideology, science as one outlook, that's an ideological formulation of science. And often I find that science studies people are fighting that battle. But sometimes they think they're fighting the sciences because I think the sciences are already plural. Thanks for 
this answer. And I'm trying also to bring uh, comments from uh, the audience into this conversation. Sure. So uh, uh, what you're like trying to say is that uh, as humanists, we can deal with different objects of with mostly every with most everything, but via different like tools and channels. So with something we can uh, deal with by emotions, for example, by anxiety. And because I have this a comment saying that maybe dealing with the long term uh, of nuclear waste effects is not something that humans can handle, but maybe we can handle that through different tools and capacities. Yeah, and some, but but what humans can do though, so, so the nuclear waste obviously has a life that is much longer than our individual lives, but the decision to produce it in this life is ours. Right? Whether or not we'll go on producing nuclear waste is made by particular people in their own lifetime. Even though once you produce the waste, the waste is a life that is much longer than your life. Uh, so, so we can, we have, we have certain kind of freedoms of certain decisions to make. But the other thing I wanted to also say about the humanities is that there is a difference between, insofar as I, I can see, there's a difference between pre-Second World War humanities and post-war humanities globally. And the difference is this, I and mean, very simply put, that you see what, and I'm not thinking about social science, now I'm thinking properly humanities. So the study of grammar, rhetoric, prosody, uh, those sorts of, um, humanities traditionally were the preserve of the aristocratic people in Europe, because it was about self-making, it was about courtly literature, it was about, so you can think of Machiavelli as a proper humanist who studies history, who studies philosophical text to make policy because <clears throat> humanities in the, were part of ruling class culture. So if I think about how the British ruled India, the British created a middle class whom they actually taught Milton, they taught Shakespeare, they taught them Petrarchan sonnets, they taught them European literature. Why? Because European literature was a claim to a civilizational superiority, right? So the British claim to rule India was based on an assumption that the British were, the Europeans were civilizationally superior. And you knew civilizational superiority by reading the humanities. Right? That's why you read Shakespeare, that's why you read Milton. And you read Milton to get, get new understandings of freedom, uh, which you didn't have in your country. It's out of the European of reading of European humanities that Indians created modern criticisms of caste and untouchability and all of those things. But what happened after the war, humanities was, were dislodged from this anchoring in the world of aristocracy to uh, a situation where education was spread and became mass education by the global expansion of the university sector in the late 1950s and 60s. So what in English we call the red brick university, you know, the universities that were beyond the model of Oxford and Cambridge and all of these classical universities. And a lot of people came into education globally who were first generation university goers. And, and humanities became like what Jim Scott calls weapons of the weak. So you now read Shakespeare to read about colonialism. You read The Tempest, not you know, to listen to the black character, right? So, so, so what happened was the humanities training over the last, I would say, for three or four generations of scholars have been about asking the question of, what divides humanity, questions of inequality, of power, of privilege, of representation. So if the previous humanity scholars were lumpers of humanity, the new scholars become splitters of humanity. So, so humanities became a subject where everybody became suspicious of any claims to oneness of humans, because their argument became that anything that involves all humans can only be addressed by first routing it through everything that divides humanity, right? So, so the argument would become that if you don't address questions of class, gender, sexuality, uh, race, that actually divides humanity, 
you can't address humanity as a whole. So there was a deep suspicion of this whole idea of humanity as a whole. And that's why when, um, uh, before the Rio conference, you know, when, um, and at the Rio conference, but when uh, the World um, Resources Institute and, and, the, and its director, Gaspet, came out with his statement on global warming, I'm talking about 1989 or thereabouts. And he said, it's humanity's problem. The first response to it, on the part of Indian activists were to say, no, it's not humanity's problems. Affluent people have created the problem. You can't equate, uh, equate uh, the subsistence emission of greenhouse gases with the luxury emission of greenhouse gases. And they insisted on greenhouse gases emissions being computed on a per capita basis, right? So I would say that the humanity scholars have now developed an instinct for differentiation of humanity and and any claim like anthropocene that seems to talk about an undifferentiated humanity um, is immediately resisted because the training has been to emphasize and distinguish differentiate humanity internally thanks uh Yuan, do you want to ask related questions before moving on. Yeah, let's see um, if there's something in the Q&A that relates to this. Yeah, <clears throat> um, this notion that you brought up now, uh, Dipesh, about um, humanists as splitters of humanities uh, or learning a differentiation instinct, uh, which kind of sounds like this question of who's the we, whether it's uh, being repeated right, right. Then and now and then in Anthropocene debates. Right. Um, there's a question that discusses this idea of us uh, humanists as um, disagreeers or that we, we try to cultivate the art of disagreeing but at the same time with regards to the subject matter so to speak the phenomena of climate change or environmental degradation or catastrophe as such is there any way of cushioning this instinct with regards to developing for lack of a better word truth uh, or um, I mean sometimes I think yeah. um, so so, you know, I mean, to give a particular example, so when I wrote my first essay for thesis, one um, thing I was criticized for a lot by fellow uh, social scientists and human humanists was because I had talked about humans having become a dominant species. And everybody objected, well, a lot of people objected to the word species because species seem to lump all humans together because humans are actually differentiated between by classes, by race, by all the, everything that makes the world unequal. Whereas it's, it's, it has seemed to me, the more I've thought about it, that if you look at the history of the last 500 years, one could argue that capitalism both produces us as an internally unequal humanity, but also makes us with our technology and the animals we farm and everything, a dominant species technology complex. So it can produce both of those outcomes at the two ends. They're not contradictory, but you have to shift your perspective to see either. Uh, but whereas, um, so what I found though, I found that a lot of the criticisms were actually thinking of them as either or. Whereas I was trying to think of them as being produced together at the same time. Okay. Uh, and, and that's why I think um, there's a real sort of work to be done uh, to how we, how we actually begin a conversation with um, disciplines like evolutionary biology, which, for a, which both assume that a species can only be a species which is because it's internally differentiated, both socially and biologically. Otherwise, there wouldn't be natural selection, right? Mm -hmm. The species has to be internally different, right. but at the same time, uses a unitary or unifying provisional concept like species. But because if you don't use the concept of species, then the idea of speciation wouldn't make sense. The idea of new species wouldn't make sense. Species extinction wouldn't make sense, right? So if you can, when you look at biological life, if you can use these concepts with respect to other forms of life, 
why couldn't one use the concept with respect to us who are also a form of life? I mean, it's not like we have completely moved out of a Darwinian narrative of life on the planet, right? So, so my struggle has been to keep the perspective of the humanities and these perspectives together. And going back to the question that Roberto was asking, as a humanist, I always find you have to begin with the experience of the individual human, because that's how we exist. We exist as individual humans. We exist within our short-term lives. We exist with our personal aspirations. My, the example of the air conditioner that I was talking about was to illustrate this, that every individual makes for very valid, understandable reasons the decision to buy air conditioners. And you can't simply negate that experience by saying air conditioners are bad until you can give them other solutions, right? But at the same time, I can say that the, that the, that the, that the sum of these small decisions to buy air conditioners, the, the sum of it is bad for the city in terms of the city becoming hotter. Mm. But sometimes I find that, that in our urge to differentiate, we lose sight of what's common. And the common is, common doesn't, the common is not the, the opposite of differentiated. The common exists through the differentiation. Okay, so it's predicated on differentiation. Yeah, the common, common is predicated. That's why I'm saying that capitalism both differentiates but produces a common reality, which is why people who are less privileged can aspire to the privileges of the more privileged. And without the revolution of aspiration, you wouldn't understand globalization. You wouldn't understand the fact that today, you know, in 2000, the Europeans and the North Americans constituted the major part of the world's consuming middle classes. Today, they constitute about 30%. So in 20 years, people from other countries, Asians, the bulk of them would be Chinese, Indian, and others, have come to that dining table, you know, of the consuming middle classes. Uh, and this aspiration can only happen because we see ourselves as belonging to some commonality. So that's why I can look at you and think, oh, you live nicely. I would like to live like that. And so the differentiation and the sense of commonness go together. Otherwise, there will be no dreams of mobility. Yeah, thanks. And uh, since you uh, spoke a bit about this paper, The Climate of History for Thesis, and we know that you are finalizing a book manuscript. So be yeah, it's actually in press. It, it, it's called The okay. Climate of History in a Planetary Age. Yeah, so I mean, the titles, titles are really uh, similar. And a question that I would like to pose to you is how do you think that the implications of science of climate change for both historical theory and political thought have changed over the last 10 years? I'll, yeah, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you a quick answer. Yes, I yeah. think it, the implications of scientific uh, discussions on, on global warming are becoming visible for things that concern humanists and, and social scientists. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So first of all, even people who don't think consciously about earth system science or whatever, but read newspapers or listen to the media or watch the media, they all know about this distinction between renewable and non-renewable fossils. But this distinction itself speaks of the distinction between human time and planetary time. Because non-renewable fossil fuels are perfectly renewable if you could wait for a few hundred million years. So when we say they're non-renewable, what we mean is that they're non-renewable over human time. So when we say there's excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what we mean is that it's excess in relationship to the speed with which we would like the natural carbon sinks of the world to absorb carbon dioxide. In other words, when we say there's excess carbon dioxide, we actually say that the earth does not work fast enough for our, our purposes, which is why we talk about sequestering carbon, drawing carbon down. So in many ways, the planet is becoming more and more visible, even when we don't consciously think of it. And let me give you the final example of that. 
So, you know, if you think of the creation of the IPCC, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, now it was set up following the success of the Montreal Protocol, which was to do with fixing the hole in the ozone layer, remember, where Paul Crutzen actually, that's why he got the Nobel Prize for uh, coming with the chemistry of it, fixing the ozone hole. So we thought of global warming as a global problem. And we went back to the United Nations because it's the only agency we have for fixing global problems set up after the war, where the whole idea is that nations will come and argue about global problems with the assumption that there's infinite amount of time at the disposal of humanity for sorting them out. That was the assumption. So if you ask a question like, when, what is the, when will Palestinians and the Israelis live in peace? Or when will Kashmiris live in a land that is not divided by nation states? There's no specific answer to it. They'll say, look, we'll have to work this out. It might take 200 years, it might take 500 years. We have to keep at it. The interesting problem about global warming and climate change is that scientists come with a definite calendar of time. They say, if you do not do this by such and such time, you'll have dangerous climate change. This is the first time we are actually facing not an indefinite calendar, but a definite calendar of action, which poses a problem for UN. So, so think of the figure two degrees Celsius. We said that if you go beyond it, as you know, the scientists came up with 1.5 degrees Celsius as the scientist figure for dangerous climate change. Nations then bargained with scientists to get extra time, <laughs> political extra time for, you know, using more fossil fuel and stuff, right? In the name of development, in the name of removing poverty. So the two degrees figure is a politically bargained figure, right? And all, but ultimately the fact that the scientists come up with definite calendar has to do with the, with the point that, that they're dealing with the planet. Whereas the United Nations was dealing with the globe, the globe is a human construction, the planet is not. And I would say increasingly the questions of planetary governance are becoming visible. We don't have the answers for it. What is the, going to the relationship between humans and non-humans in a planetary governance? What is going to be atmospheric justice, which is shared between humans, animals, and plant life? We don't know. I'm not saying we have the answers to it, but I'm saying that the science of climate change brings into view glimmers, only glimmers, of the questions of planetarity and the questions of planetary governance. And to those questions, I would submit to you, the United Nations is a very inadequate answer. So when you use the term planetary, you, uh, it's an attempt to use an inclusive term. That yeah, it's an inclusive term, but it's also distinct from the globe. Because when I think of the globe, I think the globe is what European imperialism, then capitalism, then modern nationalisms, modern, Modernize, the globe is the story of modernization, which infrastructural modernization, which happened with the help of European empires, setting up colonies, taking other people's lands, uh, then anti-colonial nationalism, which also wanted to modernize most, in most cases, right? And post-colonial modernizations like China, India. That produced the globe, and I think Carl Schmitt was absolutely right when he said the critical point is when the European nations, beginning with the Dutch, begin to navigate deep, deep seas, right? And he gives, because that's where, so the land and sea distinction is so important to that kind of thinking and this overcoming of the resistance of the deep sea. Because before that, even whaling was a coastal operation. So the, the, the capacity of the European nations to develop ships which could navigate the deep oceans is the beginning of the process of creating the globe. But if you tell the story of globalization, its main actors are humans. Humans are the protagonists. What we are now discovering is the story of something called the earth system, the planet, on which we depend for our life and existence, but which is not a creation of humans. And the, and the clearest example of that is the air we breathe. So the air we breathe in the atmosphere has oxygen at a level where it's not so much that the forests all burn up, 
nor is it so little that we choke to death. And that level of oxygen with fluctuations has been maintained for 375 million years. And that's because of certain planetary processes, what planktons do, what bacteria do, what uh, plants do, nothing to do with us, but we critically depend on it. And that's why the planet is a very different conceptual entity from the globe. And I think now we're becoming more and more aware of the planet. That's why I wrote an article last year called The Planet, an Emergent Humanist Category. So I find the distinction, and my, the book is actually about, my book is actually about working out the, the, the consequences and the ramifications of making this distinction. So, so what I say is that the, we are now living on the cusp of the global and the planetary. So the age of pure globalization, which human is, I think it's over. We are no longer simply in the global age. We are at the, at the intersection of the global and the coming age that I call planetary. Yuan, do we have questions that we can bring in? We have several, uh, not okay. really. Yeah, maybe we can just select a yeah. couple. Uh, just a quick one on this planetarity before going to the others. Um, you said glimmers of planetarity, if I was mistaken. Um, okay. Is this what you can see? A, a, is this what would be another kind of instinct that is not about uh, differentiation or disagreement, but aiming towards yes. some humanistic positivist? Um, yes, because what I find is that once we, once we acknowledge that we are dealing with something that you might call the earth system or the planet. And, and, the, and, the, and the distinction between the globe and the planet is also this, that the globe is what you can see with your eyes, even as a globe, when you create a globe, or even when you look from uh, a spaceship and see the blue dot, right? Or the blue marble, that's the globe. The earth system is a scientific construction. It's, an artif it's kind of a, it's made up of big data. So it's, it's a, it, Tim Morton's term, it's like a hyper object. It, it, it has impact like an object would, but it's not an object. So you begin to learn from earth system scientists how to see it. And as it emerges, you realize that we, you might debate why we have fallen into this situation. You may say it's capitalism. You may say, no, it's not capitalism, it's technosphere. There could be those debates, but the, everybody will acknowledge that we are having to deal with processes that go beyond the process of globalization. And therefore, to talk about planetarity, I also think is a way of talking about commonness without getting too caught up in the never ending debates on the Anthropocene. Okay. The Anthropocene debates reach a stalemate. You know, it's finally you say, I, I think of race, so it must be about race. Somebody say, I think of capital, must be about capital. And everybody, wants to think that whatever they think of is the most important factor uh, determining the Anthropocene. And I think those debates can go on. I'm not invested in them. Uh, but what I see is the emergence of something else that I can call the planet. And that you have to deal with, whether you come through the race question, whether you come to the class question or the nation question, you have to deal, I mean, eventually that's what is affecting our lives. And, and we, have, we have to deal with it. But another related question then from the questions that have come in, um, this is obviously a scaling up, if I understand, right. of, of what the kind of scale that you would wish us to be at. Is there a class dimension to this or a, a, some kind of differentiation among the humanity who can access There, there is, I mean, there, well, like everything else, like all knowledge, its availability, its production is always differentiated. I mean, if you just look at the literature on global warming and ask yourself, why haven't Chinese or Indian scientists written popular books on global warming? They write specialized papers on global warming. I know about the Indian scene. I don't know as much about the Chinese scene. I mean, uh, there are now interesting books coming out of China on technology and how to think about it in the Chinese context. Fascinating books. But I have not come across a Chinese author who has said, who's written a book like David Archer's book on, on global warming or many other books. So in, in many ways, you could still say that the West has both the technological and the institutional capacity to name a problem, to articulate it. And that in itself, unbeknown to us, introduces Western biases. 
into how we talk about it, how we think about it. So, so the, the unevenness of the world has impact on the production of knowledge. I'm not denying it for a moment, right? But that's the world we live in. I mean, if we didn't have Cold War, we didn't, if we didn't have space war, we wouldn't have had the modern Earth system science because NASA sets up its first subcommittee on Earth system science in 1985. And James Hansen comes to work with for NASA uh, between 60 and 66 in Carl Sagan's unit, working on whether or not Mars ever had life or if Mars could be colonized. And that's completely part of the space war and part of the Cold War. So yes, you live in an uneven world where the more powerful nations both create its problems and have the institutional capacity to then formulate the problem. I mean, think of, um, think of the, the data we have from ice core samples to be able to tell the temperature of the air of the earth for let's say going back 800,000 years. Now, but how do we, where does the technology for digging comes? It comes from the same industry that gave the oil industry its digging technology. So the facts we are collecting about fossil fuel come out of the fossil fuel industry. I mean, the, the petroleum geologists, petroleum company geologists have played a very important role in actually producing a lot of data that, that speaks to the problem of global warming. And uh, so, so you live in that world where uh, the part of the world that is damaging the planet is unfortunately also the part of the world that is equipped with institutions to, to produce its science. There are other parts of the, there are other resources that other parts of the world have. So you can go to indigenous societies and learn from them how humans might live as just one animal among many other animals. You can go to older religions, not the axial religions like Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or Judaism, but to Australian Aboriginal religions to learn about why humans are not special in the scheme of things. So other societies have these other kinds of resources we need. But, but in terms of the science of global warming, it comes out of a very uneven world. And therefore the public sphere, I mean, think of it, I mean, Swarkar was saying very interesting things about the place of Stockholm and Sweden in producing environmental humanities. And, and he's totally right, but, I'm, but as a global citizen, I have to think, and why doesn't it come out of Delhi? Why is not Beijing? Why is not Moscow the place? Why does it happen in, in Sweden? So, so there's a certain heritage of in, institutions, which includes business institutions, as well as... Uh, uh, university institutions, uh, academic institutions that produces this privilege. And you know, my best example of this I often give to my classes is the, it's Kant, the course that Kant used to teach on anthropology. It was based on travel literature. Now, if you look at the travel between Middle East, Iran, Persia, you know, the Arabic nations to India, there was a huge amount of travel when the Muslims were ruling India. And there's a huge amount of travel literature. But India did not have any institutional capacity to process that literature and produce a subject that you would call anthropology. So this historical institutional capacity of European nations, which also has to do with the rise of European empires and uh, capitalism and all of those things, which has created the uneven world, there's a legacy of it that you and I are part of and we have to deal with. That's a legacy we'll get back to discussing further in the streams, I guess. Roberta, uh, yeah. we have like three minutes left. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I think that, that reflecting on, on privileges that, are, that we inherited is a good way to conclude this sure. uh, conversation. And uh, we are really grateful that you could Thank join. You. And we, uh, we hope to welcome you in person next year in Stockholm. Sure. Thank absolutely. you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very us. much. Thank you for having me as part of the program and, uh, and have a very successful uh, rest of the program. Yeah, thank you. And we will wait for your book. <laughs> we can't sure. wait. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
And thank you again, everyone who sent in questions. Uh, we will save those. Um, obviously, we're not able to deal with all of them, um, but we do as best we can with the time we have. Okay, so just now in two minutes, we're going to start again with the next session. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if you need to get up and stretch, do so now. Okay, Roberta, talk soon.